As toddlers, we fight against it, and later in life, we crave it. We all know how miserable we feel if we don't get it, even for just 20 hours. But for some, every night is a fight to get that sweet stuff we call sleep. Insomnia can mean difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, waking in the night, or rousing too early in the morning. Is it related to ill health? What can we do to prevent it? And is there a fix? Stand by, Go Healthy For Good starts right now. Hello and welcome to Go Healthy For Good. One thing you don't know about yourself is what you do when you're asleep. Meet George and his wife. She was alarmed by what happened to him when he slept. Watch. Seven years ago, my husband suffered, they said, a mild heart attack. Like a small vein be behind a bigger vein got in trouble. <laughs> and. Um, very, quite soon after the heart attack and after the treatment, um, he started putting on weight. And I really, I really don't know how long it took, but it, hap it was happening, so the weight was increasing. And he started snoring. And it was worse and worse and so bad that maybe four and a half, five years into that, I got very scared. Um, not the noise bothered me, but I was afraid he would die. When he was when sleeping during his sleep at night, um, his breathing was so um, heavy to say, and also he would have he would, yeah, big big uh, gaps in between breathing, in between breath, so pausing. So I thought that's too much. I never tried to to measure it to time it, but I realized it's, it's long. So I was afraid that he would die. <laughs> so, and, and also, his sleep was not very healthy. He would sleep for two, three hours, then he would wake up and, and go for a walk in the, in the house and, and continue on the living room couch. He said that's more comfortable, that he can uh, sit like that better and stuff like that, so. She saw me from outside, you see, so I... Well, you were sleeping. And you she, was was telling was me, she was telling me, you, you have problems. You stop breathing and uh, snoring and, well, snoring, you know, it's coming, but... Uh, but it was strong snoring. Yeah, very strong. So she saw me from outside and I said, well, that's very... But I knew from inside I would wake up seven times a night, you know, and uh, sometimes I just couldn't go back to sleep. I had to go on the couch and I was tired the next day. I would fall asleep, especially when I'm driving and this is horrible and uh, I found uh, very, very disturbing. Uh, the energy level was very low, uh, and it was bad, very bad, you know. I am trying to keep my level, you know, but certainly, yeah, it irritated yeah, easily, boy. and uh, uh, so I, uh, it, it did affect the mood, definitely. Which is understandable when you wake seven times a night. We'll hear the rest of George's story, speak with our favorite sleep expert again, learn more tips for a good night's sleep, and get on the move with Sean. So let's kick off with the news. In the headlines today, when you eat matters, children aging faster, and sleep suppresses suicide. Eating a large meal in the evening increases the risk for diabetes and heart disease. Researchers surveyed over 12,000 adults and found those who consumed at least 30% of their total daily calories after 6 p.m. had 25% higher chance of hypertension and 20% higher odds of prediabetes compared with those who ate less in the evening. Late eaters had higher fasting glucose, insulin and insulin resistance, and higher blood pressure. These are all risk factors for type 2 diabetes and heart disease, so be sure to consume more of your calories earlier in the day. Children who get less than the recommended 9 to 11 hours of sleep at night may be aging faster. Telomeres are the caps at the end of chromosomes that shorten with age. In a recent study, researchers measured the telomeres in over 1,500 kids aged 9 years of age. Comparing those who slept the most with those who slept the least, researchers found that each hour less of sleep reduced telomere length by 1.5%. Telomeres protect our DNA during cell division, which is essential for both growth and repair. Short telomeres have been linked to cancer, heart disease, and cognitive decline. 
so be sure your children always get the right amount of sleep for their age. How long a teenager sleeps determines how likely they are to engage in risky behaviour and self-harm. Data from the Youth Risk Behaviour Survey taken of 2007 to 2015 showed that more than 70% of high school students are now getting less than the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. Less sleep was associated with increased odds of unsafe behaviours such as risk taking while driving, that's drunk driving, potentially unsafe sexual activity, aggressive behaviour and use of alcohol, tobacco and other drugs. The strongest associations were seen in relation to mood and self-harm. Compared to sleeping eight hours per night, teens who slept less than six hours were three times more likely to think about suicide, plan their suicide or attempt suicide. So keep screens out of bedrooms and be sure your teen gets eight hours of sleep every night. Their life may depend on it. I'm Dr. Narada McKibben and that's today's health news. Today's guest is Dr. Param Didia, Director of Sleep Medicine at Canyon Ranch in Tucson, Arizona. He spoke at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine meeting in Indianapolis, where I caught up with him. I asked him how insomnia affects all aspects of our lives. In the year 2000, the physical conversation, as you've asked, heart health, number one cause of death and dying in the developed world, and the privileged world, is heart disease. In the year approximately 2000 or so, the sleep health heart study came out, which correlated poor sleep with heart disease. Up to that point, it was a nice idea, but then it became very much a clinical conversation. One of the biggest things in sports medicine right now is looking at sleep. It's given that 2.0, it's given that edge, that ability to not just be awake and aware, but to be of high performance. Another way I like to say it is, somebody had a good workout today, you want the full benefits, get your sleep at night, a lot of that repair is going to honor the next day. But one last part on that is when you are physically active during the day, you are then going to be able to get more effective sleep, which then gets you ready for the next day. So it's really eloquent, the ebb and flow, the mental and emotional. I think just from people's experience, call it being a little bit uh, fickle, call it a little bit grumpy, call it in terms of being despondent. All of these things are very closely connected. We do know that anxiety and depression very much are linked to that of sleep and vice versa. It's bi-directional. And we do know that the ability to repair the brain. Many people comment on what it could be. From my readings, I look at sleep and dreams. Something called the limbic system of the brain opens up during our dreams. We clear out negative thoughts. But that'll cut us off. Somebody who said something rude to us. That old negative thought that seemingly won't go away. There's something magical that happens. And we're learning more and more sleep isn't just a physical repair, but mental and emotional mm. as well. So it's really important. It also impairs our ability to focus. And so is there a link also between perhaps attention deficit disorder and, and sleep deficit? Absolutely. Small studies, uh, attention deficit is classically defined in children. And studies that I've looked at in clinics that are honoring children, I believe age 8 to 13, but nevertheless very young, 30% of them in some studies were found to have poor sleep. And the, some of the more straightforward studies look at breathing. Tonsils, adenoids, allergies from the nasal passages. When helping those children breathe better, validating that they're better sleepers, those who were previously diagnosed with attention, attention deficit, we became clear of it. I'm not pretending that all sleep is attention deficit and vice versa, but in some of these studies of about 30%, that's an amazing and notable overlap. Now you mentioned that heart disease is related to disordered sleep. Yeah. Any other sort of end outcomes that, that we see with disordered sleep? I mean, there's so many that we're starting to, to look at. You take a look at some of the studies I look at insomnia, difficulty getting to sleep, staying asleep, and a daytime impairment. Just about everything in the medical textbook from that of not just the cardio, but also the pulmonary diseases, but also that of immunology. Some studies that even link the discussion to that of cancer. So that it's really just taking out the highlighter through the entire textbook of medicine, trying to say what pieces of it. it doesn't look like anything gets spared with poor sleep. Which means we need to highlight sleep in our daily schedule. More from Dr. Parham in the next segment, 
But let's finish with this. Mmm, I love dead animals. I like mine alive. What's so good about dead ones? They taste good. Oh, but those factory farmed animals are full of antibiotics. Oh, more antibiotics in my diet. Well, that's like eating preventive medicine. That's good for me, isn't it? No, regular antibiotics cause bacterial resistance and create superbugs, and they maim and kill. Oh, that's not good, is it? Mm -mm. And those factory farmed animals are given hormones. Oh, more hormones in my diet. Well, that will make us men more menly and you women more womanly, won't it? Not necessarily. Now, what if it makes women more manly and men more feminine and maybe impotent? Oh, that's not good at all. And maybe it would make cancers grow faster. Oh, cancers growing more fast? That's terrible. Mm -hmm. And then there's E. coli and salmonella, foodborne diseases found in beef and chicken. Oh. That, that's beef, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mm. Oh. Do you want to hear more? Oh, I feel sick. Get me a doctor. I'm a doctor. How can I help? Stop talking about meat. Oh, you mean you don't want to hear about listeriosis and botulism, which cause miscarriages and death? Oh, I feel sick. Oh, grow up. You're fine. I am? Yes, you just need to be a lot more careful about what you eat. And so do you. Doctor's orders. How much sleep should we actually get? Well, the National Sleep Foundation made the following recommendations for the number of hours of sleep we need based on our age. For newborns less than three months old, it's 14 to 17 hours. For infants four months to a year old, 12 to 15 hours. For toddlers, 11 to 14 hours. Preschoolers, 10 to 13 hours. By the time you get to school, you're down to nine to 11 hours. And teenagers still need more than adults at eight to 10 hours. Adults, seven to nine hours. And older adults over 65, you actually need almost as much sleep, seven to eight hours. And if we don't get enough, we get grumpy and emotional. It affects our relationships. And then if we actually look at the brain, there's a 60 to 80% drop in the blood flow to the frontal lobe and the thalamus. Now that sets us up for depression, poor decision making, and cognitive impairment. We actually can't concentrate very well. We become clumsy. We don't see danger when it's there, and we make mistakes. Mistakes like Three Mile Island nuclear accident, Chernobyl, and the Challenger disaster, they were all related in some way to sleep deprivation. And did you know that alcohol and sleep deprivation vie for top killers on our roads. You know, when, when we're sleep deprived, we struggle to learn new skills, we forget things, and we lack motivation. We really don't want to do anything. We lose our joy and our zest for life. That makes us really boring friends and family members. Our immune system also becomes impaired. We're more prone to infections, they last longer. We also get an increase in lung disease, in heart disease, and hypertension, diabetes, and a lot of chronic disease. And when we significantly cut sleep, the body makes an overabundance of stress chemicals like norepinephrine and cortisol. And each hour that we are short of our recommended sleep will increase the body weight by three quarters of a pound. There are two hormones in the brain, leptin and ghrelin, and they control our feelings of hunger and fullness. And so when we lack sleep, these hormones are affected and we snack more, we have more food cravings, we just can't satisfy our appetite, especially at night and we crave junk food. So it's not the carrots that we sneak into the fridge for, it's more likely to be the carrot cake. So try to schedule more time for sleep. And if you just can't sleep, here are some tips. The body makes a substance called adenosine. The more adenosine we have, the more time our brain spends in deep sleep. So how do we stimulate more production of adenosine? Exercise. But there's something that kills adenosine and that we need to cut out, and that's caffeine. Caffeine-containing compounds, coffee, tea, some herbal teas even, sodas, energy drinks, and even chocolate contain caffeine. So you need to eliminate these things if you're having trouble sleeping. And while we're on the subject of drinks, there's one drink to bear in mind, alcohol. 
One drink of alcohol will disrupt sleep for two hours. It suppresses our dream sleep, increases snoring and sleep apnea, and it makes the brain fidgety at a time when it's actually really important for the brain to be very organized during sleep. Exercising to tolerance where we've got your heart racing, you're breathing hard, that will increase the production of a natural tranquilizer called delta-induced polypeptide. So if you haven't had a good workout, even just a brief one today, then you're not gonna sleep as well as if you had done that. Now the other thing to bear in mind is exposure to daylight, especially in the morning. That's gonna help us sleep that night. And then cutting light near bedtime will boost the melatonin production and that is gonna help us get a good night of sleep. So all of these little things add up to either a poor night of sleep or a great night of sleep. George had a heart attack and began to put on weight began to snore at night and developed sleep apnea. His wife often wondered if he would die in the night. Watch. He's driving from Los Angeles, um, east in San Bernardino County, and it's an hour and a half drive or less, and sometimes it took three hours and bumper to bumper, and he complained that he cannot stand the, the lights of the car and he's afraid he fall asleep and have an accident or somebody bumps into him or, or he bumps into someone. So he was very concerned. So, um, yeah, we, I, I personally, I was very concerned and I made several appointments until he kept one. I had to go with him, which I did. And um, they were so, <laughs> the doctor was so thankful <laughs> that I went with him because um, eventually he had the sleep study done. I did that test, you know, I took it back. They told me in about two weeks to called for results, but they called they me the next call day. For the they called me back the next day. Come, it's very bad. So I went there and uh, they showed me the results and... The sonogram. They look horrible. I wouldn't breathe for like, I don't know, a minute or something. Over, like quite over a, quite a, a Quite a gap of time. Up to 90 you seconds. You know, I was um, dying. You know, I should have stopped living in my sleep. And in fact, uh, before, I would wake up sometimes with the feeling that I'm not breathing. You know, I'm just suddenly wake air. up and I feel like uh, you go for air, you know, for life. George was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea and they recommended um, for him to start using as soon as possible a special breathing machine. And I was afraid it's going to be the CPAP, you know, the big, uh, and I know he wouldn't, he wouldn't stand it on his face comp entirely. And, uh, and it also, that one also makes a noise. So um, they tried to show it to us to see how it looks. And they said, oh, it's very easy, and tried to sh uh, show how it works. And he got very positive about it, so I was happy. <laughs> happy indeed. And so was George, and we'll hear why later in the show. I asked today's guest, sleep specialist, Dr. Param Didia, to explain the relationship between what we eat and how we sleep. I often get asked, is there a magical food? <laughs> We all want that. And there's no question what bedtime treat would be that sweet. Oh, yes. What we're finding is that this conversation potentially is related to the timing and the amount of the food that really is going to have the great impact. You know, we spend most of our energy during the daytime, so conventional wisdom that appeals to us is to make sure you have enough energy during the daytime. But having something energy rich at night may seemingly make you tired, but you get that huge up of sugar and then you get that crash, that bit of coma. We also do need to appreciate that the gut needs to digest that and therefore can be pro-inflammatory. Inflammation at nighttime is not helpful at all to be able to get that of sleep. So having something much more modest and easier to digest, we find that real food is much easier to digest overall. There's always variation from person to person. But sticking with something that's much closer to nature absolutely overall in the clinical experience I've seen shows itself to be true. So you say real food, meaning simple ingredients, yeah. not packaged and all that high fat, sugar, salt. So real food, especially towards Precisely. The, the later in the day, but preferably all day. Yes, you will also want to appreciate the timing in another way. There are some provocative studies that really tap into that which was given the Nobel Prize last year, the circadian rhythm. We have an internal clock. We have external factors that impact that clock. And among the things that we've appreciated is having breakfast. 
right? There's always been a debate. Should we have or not have that breakfast? You read these right. journals, you read it in the news. And I'm not pretending one size fits all, but when the body has a system and is regular, we entrain the body in a helpful way. Some of my colleagues who do the work in cognitive behavioral therapy will tell me, gosh, instituting breakfast can sometimes make a huge benefit. I'm intrigued and amazed when I hear something like that. It gets me very curious about this and how we can help people in a real way rather than making something holistically overwhelming. Is it true that poor sleep makes you choose highly processed food? There's no question in my mind that the sleepy person is the craving person. I know that from my own experience. I can go around talking about exercise, nutrition, but when I'm tired or cranky, what do I find? Give me that sugar, give me that fat, give me that now. There's neurochemistry that speaks to all of that. And we can beat ourselves up for not having enough willpower. We can beat ourselves up for anything along the way. But this is neuroscience, an opportunity to be humbled by it and be aware of it. There's no way to overthink this or outthink yourself from that of your cravings. They kind of come on before we know it. That's so true. Now, with I'm thinking, you know, you mentioned circadian rhythm yeah. and what about people who work shifts? How do they get around this? Because I notice when I'm on a night shift, I'll crave all of that stuff, yeah. but, but also I'm, tr I'm struggling to sleep. This is a very real concern because we live in a 24-7 world. There's never an opportunity to be off. The speed of business, the speed of society is much faster. Nevertheless, circadian rhythm, circa around around a day is what circadian really means. So the conversation is whatever we can do to create as many patterns in our life. Different seasons of our life, we may need to flip that of our schedules, but overall it ought to be time limited because it's not sustainable to go from one to another. So if somebody can package your life so that they have a set of nights and try to create some routine around that, that's gonna be their best opportunity. We'd love to believe that there's something magical that one can do around that, so whenever you can get your rest, we try to do that and be able to mitigate how much exhaustion and sleepiness are there and to pre-plan as much as one can because the body cannot be fighting its bone biology. Right, now is there a role for taking melatonin? When someone's jet lagged or doing shifts, is, is there yeah, a place? It's interesting, when you look at the scientific research on this, it is famous for a shifting clock. So we tend during our darker hours to make more melatonin. We do this very robustly during that of our younger years, school years and teen years, less so as you and I get older. So melatonin also gets a lot of popularity knowing that light can decrease melatonin, meaning if you have light close to that of your bedtime within two hours of your bedtime. So it appeals to us to be able to look at melatonin. The studies are very mixed in terms of what it's uh, showing, but without question, I always like to give people a trial of this knowing that there is a small percentage that will get the side effects. Grogginess in the morning, being like hungover, and others will get very, I'll just call them wicked dreams, psychedelic almost. They, they look at you with big eyes saying they'll never touch it again. Overall, smaller doses where we're looking at, it appeals to us for other reasons. It's an antioxidant, and interesting, it also helps the digestive tract move forward. So we are seeing melatonin has many effects. We're still focusing on that of sleep, so famously, shifting our clock, not so famous of getting and keeping us to sleep, but I have a number of people who swear by that. Studies have to show this to be you know, understood how we can individualize this. We're still learning how to use it. And when you say small doses, what dose? Thank you. I will share one, two, and three milligrams is where we like to start people, but more and more on the shelf, I'm seeing five, 10 milligrams that are being available. And then the question is how much of that really gets by available? I will say, as much as the research always says to get by with less, clinically, I'm not seeing people harmed by five and 10 milligrams either. One of the things we also look to do is to discuss, do you have to take it every night? We do wonder, we don't know, by taking melatonin, are you decreasing your natural production of it? As we've learned with some antioxidant studies, by taking antioxidant, endogenous natural antioxidants become less produced. So if we can minimize the everyday part of it, that might be better. Makes sense to let your brain make its own so it doesn't get lazy. Before we go to the break, let's hear more of what the Bible has to say about sleep. 
It's a wonderful feeling to slowly emerge from a deep restorative night of sleep, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 5 says the abundance of the rich will not allow him to sleep. Perhaps his diet is abundant as well, resulting in too much rich food. Perhaps he's so rich he doesn't need to work very much physically and that sets him up for a poor night of sleep. Or maybe he lies awake worrying about all the responsibility that comes with managing wealth. But you know, you don't have to be wealthy to have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. And it's usually related to stress or anxiety. You're probably familiar with the Bible story of Jesus sleeping through the storm. He and his disciples were in a boat traveling across Lake Galilee one night. It's a big lake and big storms can make big waves. His disciples were experienced fishermen and they just knew that this storm would sink their boat. As the lightning flashed across the sky, they were shocked to see Jesus still fast asleep in the back of the boat. They shook him awoke and said, Master, don't you care that we're all going to drown? He stood up and said to the storm, Peace, be still. And immediately there was calm. He wants to speak that same peace and calm into the storm of your life. Peace, be still. You know, most of us don't move enough. That's why it's been said that many more people rust out than wear out. So don't sit there rusting. What kind of rust prevention have you got for us today, Sean? We are all about the anti-rust, right? Yeah. So let's, we're going to grab a dumbbell today and we're going to work in different directions, all right? And talking about taking the rust off, going in different directions really pinpoints, you know, us not going in a certain direction. And if we feel certain things, we know we need to there's room for improvement. Right. So uh, let's get warmed up. We're going to do a forward lunge, all right? We have some forward lunges in there today, uh, but right. we're just going to do an alternating forward lunge, just going forward and back, okay? You can always add to this by doing arm reach every time you do a lunge. This allows your arms to get warmed up because we have an arm exercise or push-up. <laughs> no! Right? So this is a good way to get warm. Wash your mouth out. I know, I know, I know. You love it. All right, three, two, and one. All right, for this exercise, you can choose to use a dumbbell or you can choose to not use a dumbbell. There's a lot of moving parts and we're talking about different directions that we typically don't work. For us today, we're gonna use a 10-pound dumbbell and I'll walk you through it first just so that you see how it flows, okay? Think of this as a clock. Okay. All right, we have a forward lunge. Five nice, tight, right? Core nice and tight. We have a 45 degree lunge. We have a lateral lunge. We have a reverse 45 degree lunge going right back here. We have a reverse lunge all the way back. And then we have a curtsy lunge all the way back here. A lot of different movements, mm. all right? Okay. Now, the challenge for you here, you have that flow on your right hand side, then you have it on your left hand side, and then you have one push up. Oh, I can cope with one. Yes, just oh, one. There you go. I should have kept my legs straight, right? Nice, nice adjustment. 45 degree, reverse lunge, and then your curtsy lunge. Perfect. Now you gotta get the other side. Okay, forward lunge. Start forward. Right, 45 degree lunge. Lateral lunge, reverse 45 degree, yes. Reverse lunge all the way back, and then your curtsy lunge, perfect. So that's one and one, right. and now you have one perfect form push up. You can On my it. knees, right? Yeah, you can, that's fine. There you go, <laughs> give me one push up, perfect. Keep it nice and tight, walk your feet to your hands. Take a deep breath, this is an opportunity to rest. Okay. Figure out what you can do better. All right. Second round, you do the same thing, but now you just keep on incrementally adding, right? So now you have so two on the right. Two forward, two. No. No? So you two, do that. Two circles. Yes, okay. two circles. So try again. All right, here we go. Here you go. Forward lunge, 45 degree lunge, your lateral lunge, your reverse 45 degree, your reverse lunge, and then your curtsy lunge. Yes. 
Now go right back into it again. Forward lunge, 45 degree lunge, lateral lunge, reverse 45 degree lunge, reverse lunge, and your curtsy lunge, right? So that entire flow, right? Yep. You see how you can go from two oh, yeah. to two push-ups and then three of those to three push-ups. It is no joke. Yeah. And when you're limited for time, all right, a great way for you to maximize your time, work in your entire body. Yeah. Give me a good curtsy lunge. Yes, I like it. I like it. You got one more. I have. You do. <laughs> I'm holding you accountable. <gasps> 45 degrees. There you go, lateral lunge. Keep the toes pointing forward. Reverse 45. Reverse lunge. And then your curtsy lunge. All right, Woo. perfect. Put that weight down. Take a nice deep breath and you have two push-ups. Two push-ups. Two push-ups. Awesome I form. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. One, breathe, and two. Nice job. <gasps> you may find your weakness during this. So your goal is to take your weakness and make it a strength, right? So. Can we ask how many do you do? How many oh. do you get up to? I get to about 10. Yeah. And it gets a little spicy. Um, and then I have to call it quits. <laughs> so great job. I really, it was good work. Good form, all right? Roll the shoulders back. Open and close. Alternate your right hand on the top, left hand on the top. This allows for you to stretch out your chest and stretch out your lap. All right, come down, lean forward, come all the way here about 90 degrees, don't stop, come up and breathe. All right, there you go. Wow, that was spicy. Yes, it was. Thanks, Sean. You're very welcome. Our cells love antioxidants. Antioxidants protect our cells against damage. An excellent source of antioxidants are fruits and vegetables. Fruits and veggies are high in vitamins A, C, and E, all great antioxidants. A 2011 Korean study found that vegetarians consumed approximately two times more antioxidant vitamins than their meat-eating counterparts. An antioxidant-rich vegetarian diet is another ageless advantage. It's time for your questions. Here's our first one. Someone called in, what are some natural remedies for hot flashes? Well, a good one that I recommend is a natural menopausal product called Remy Femin. And it's a herbal mix of a, a bunch of herbs, black cohosh, trace tree, dong quai, licorice root, and milk thistle seed. But only use it if you check first with your doctor that they won't interfere with any medication you're on. And be sure you're not uh, have, that you don't have high blood pressure, that you're not on blood pressure medications. Or if you are, you just need to monitor your blood pressure if you do start taking them. None of those herbs will aggravate any pre-existing heart problems. Now, Alva asks, could sleep apnea and epilepsy be related? Yes, anything that stresses the brain will lower the seizure threshold. And if you already have epilepsy, it can make it worse. Even just getting tired will do that. Here's our next question. I yawn whenever I wake up during the night and all through the morning, but it subsides in the evening. What's going on? Well, there are a number of reasons why you can have excessive yawning. Um, and it may be due to a sleep disorder. That would be the most obvious one. Or it's, so if your doctor wants to test for that, it's a good idea. Or it can be from medications that you might be taking. So you do need to talk to your doctor. It can be a signal of more serious conditions involving the brain, the heart or the liver. Now for the liver, you can, your doctor can do a, just a blood test that will easily check whether your liver is okay. And for the sleep, just make sure you're on a good schedule. And if your doctor does want to do a sleep study, please comply. That way you can rule out the sleep disorder. You can engage in moderate to vigorous exercise every day. That will improve the efficiency of the sleep. So you can be in bed all night, but not have an efficient sleep. By, be by exercising during the day, you can make that sleep deep and efficient. If you, have a sleep, if, if you don't have a sleep disorder, like your doctor makes sure of that, then you may want to see a neurologist if you've done all those sleep hygiene things and make sure that there's no brain or central nervous system problem. Now, Love to hear from you. Send in your questions. You can leave them on our phone, text them, go to the website, or become part of our Facebook community where you get health tips during the day and also you can uh, get videos and just stay in touch that way. So we always love to invite you to join our Facebook community. Now, let's go shopping.
Strawberries were mentioned in ancient Roman literature in references to their medicinal uses. The French brought them wild from the forest into their gardens in the 1300s. Art in the Renaissance used the strawberry to symbolize perfect righteousness. And at that time, the plant was used to treat depression. Now it's rightfully used for food, mostly eaten raw, but with high calorie additives like sugar and cream. However, they are so yummy, just as they are. High in fiber and potassium, research shows that they boost the immune system. They're antioxidant and they're mildly anti-inflammatory. They may have benefits against cancer, aging, inflammation, eye health and neurological disease. Some people are allergic to the red ones. So you might, those people might want to try the white ones instead. Bon appétit. For many women, insomnia becomes a significant issue once they reach their 50s. I asked today's expert guest, Dr. Putnam, for some tips and tricks. Appreciating, number one, that it can be very much about the physiology changes. Less estrogen, less progesterone. We find that just not the, what I like to call the athletic, the beach muscles, so to speak. We know when estrogen, progesterone are lower, especially estrogen, those muscles get softer, but same with the airway. So we do know that some of those sleep breathing, call it sleep apnea, become much more notable. The temperature changes absolutely can be very much a conversation and vary from individual to individual. We do know that the rules of engagement, the rules of the body have greatly shifted when a woman is transitioning and fully into menopause. And it's really hard to compare any two. Again, the forethought of whatever we can be doing to create our rituals and strengthen the other things around us as much as we can. And to truly appreciate, indeed, to be aware, is there a breathing discussion? Is there these temperature shifts? And what can we be doing to help with that? There is indeed, without question, an opportunity to really focus on exercise and nutrition. My colleagues who work in women's health on this show themselves to have a lot more benefit of really strengthening those things during the daytime that can set up our nighttime sleep. Not very easy, but very important. Mm. You also mentioned restless leg syndrome or yeah. the, the new name willis Eckbond disease. Yeah. Let's expand that a little bit, because that's quite common, isn't it? Yes, so the old term restless legs, misnomer, not just the legs, it can be the arms, it can be the torso, and it can vary from night to night. This makes it very difficult to pick up on, because night to night you may not know what's going on. Traditionally, if I think I have something, it should be there all the time. And that's the reason this breaks conventional thought. 50% is likely genetic and 50% is likely developed. And that's the humility also of looking at this. We do know that among the hypotheses is lower dopamine in the brain. All humans have less dopamine before bed, maybe at the earliest hours, say 11 p.m. to 3 a.m but people with restlessness tend to be even lower. It can be throughout the body and it can vary, and that's the reason why this gets missed a lot. When there is underlying causes, there's many to look at. The famous one is lower iron. Mm -hmm. And a woman's life through blood loss, we know that there's no question with that in the menstrual cycle. Somebody having gastrointestinal bleeding, these are very famous reasons why somebody might have lower iron. Some people are not absorbing it well. So just eating healthy food doesn't mean we necessarily get all the benefits, especially we have lower stomach acid. Going beyond that, we also do appreciate that there are uh, an opportunity to see perhaps B vitamins, thyroid, kidney health. So you really need to look at a person from head to toe. Some of the little clues to know that you might want to be curious, some of the older literature talks about teeth clenching and grinding being with an overlap in those with restlessness. So that might be sometimes a clue. Another one that I like to provoke people to think about is did they have growing pains when they were getting taller? Because there is a definite overlap with that as well. So the awareness piece is really important. What we do know is what can we do without pills? Because there's so many discussions out there. Yeah. Exercising during the daytime, stretching, absolutely important. We find that to be very helpful. Foods that are rich in magnesium are debated, but there is a group of people that do really well with magnesium, especially closer to bedtime. It's a smooth muscle relaxant. We give magnesium for headache syndromes. You know, high dose magnesium is given to women at childbirthing times. So we definitely want to use something very simplistic whenever possible. 
I will share with you that this is much more common than most people think. And that's the reason why I'm so glad we're talking about it, because probably, in my estimation, one out of 10 people have something. The literature says 3%. I feel it's more when you educate people, people start noticing it. Right, because, and, it, and it's not a classic, clear, this is what you, you see or feel. It, it's all a little bit subjective, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, in dream sleep, we're paralyzed, right? Yeah. What about for people who sleepwalk, who, who act out their dreams? Is, is that a problem? So it always is a great opportunity to be very curious. Most of dreams are what you and I call dreams during that rapid eye movement, REM sleep, are those great stories, those mythical uh, opportunities <laughs> in our lives. Fragments, sounds, mm -hmm. visions can happen anytime during sleep. So a recall of different things is difficult. 10 minutes after a dream, 90% of the content's gone. After five minutes of a dream, 50%'s gone. So what's happening in terms of sleep? When somebody is acting out a dream, that's the one that gets our attention. It's called REM behavior disorder because we should be paralyzed. And there's a number of things we wanna look at. First and foremost, is there an underlying sleep disorder or something that's fragmenting our sleep? Something that's waking us when we should be paralyzed and therefore getting the activity centers of the brain online. So that's one we don't wanna miss. But overall, what we do know is that any medical disorder, but also any sleep disorder, can be waking us during a dream, even though we should be paralyzed. One of the things I'd like to point out, we're paralyzed in a dream except for our eyes, our heart, and our diaphragm, our breathing muscle. But our rib cage that allows us to billow that air to ventilate is paralyzed. So if you have an obstructive sleep disorder, you may not breathe as well. Mm -hmm. And therefore, sometimes somebody's apnea gets worse during that of the dream time. And now if I'm not breathing well, air hunger is among the worst things that we can ever imagine. Days of old when we were playing in the pool and somebody holds our head underneath a little long, mm -hmm. we come up and it's an awful experience. It's a huge discord in the body. So we do know that if somebody were to have that in the middle of a dream, they could be waking up. And now all of a sudden, the body has to come back online while the dream's going on. So I wanna know everything about a person if they're getting symptoms in a dream which is just what was happening to George before he got his beautiful machine. We'll talk with Dr. Parham about cures for insomnia in the last segment, so stick around. George was waking up seven times a night with desperate feelings of air hunger from severe sleep apnea. His wife kept making appointments at the sleep clinic for him, but he refused to go. After six appointments, he finally agreed, and the sleep study was so bad, they gave him a ventilation machine the very next day. That night, he slept for 13 hours straight and had dreams for the first time in years. Watch. And the first night when he started, he slept from 9.30 to almost 8 o'clock. Yeah, that stop. never happened. No stop. That was and he amazing. said he, he, his sleep was so restful. I believe the first night when I used this machine, I had dreams. I used to have dreams before, and I enjoyed them. Most of the time, beautiful dreams. And I didn't have dreams for years. And I knew, as much as I know about this part of life, you know, I am not a doctor, but I knew that my body went into that deep sleep cycle. And, uh, and, um, and I, I'm, I'm so amazed, you know, it's a beautiful machine. I mean, now that I'm using this machine and I'm sleeping all night, nonstop, I feel so much better. I feel energized and I feel the body has enough oxygen. You know, the way it works is so amazing. It has a mask with a tube and it has some kind of electronic device that pushes the air For a you. certain stream. So when you inhale, it forces the air in, into your lungs. But you know, then anytime you try to exhale, that just stops and it, it's just no, absolutely no, it doesn't bother you at all. But it's so fascinating. But now if I sleep without, let's see sometimes I just, you know, start to have a snooze. My body is reacting in the same way. I inhale deeply. You know, my, my body is, uh, is, uh, is like being conditioned now, programmed to, to uh, follow that, uh, uh, you know, the electronic uh, pattern. 
is fascinating. And, and that I sleep very well. I sleep uh, when I go to bed, 10.30, and I get up at um, you know, 4 o'clock. Usually I'm, I'm an early bird, so I get up at 4 or so, 5 o'clock, nonstop. Oh, I feel very good. You know, I start singing in the morning, which is so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, no problem with the behind the wheel. I still, I think it's behind I get bored. I don't like driving. So it's probably because I get it's so bored long. driving that I have the tendency to, but it's not so bad as before. You know, because I sleep better. And what I see is the change of oxygen in my body. The fact that I breathe so deeply, I'm forced, but in a very gentle and beautiful way. It is a wonderful machine. And I have it. I told my wife I should get another one because if this one breaks down, I'm in trouble, you know. By the time I get another one, I better have one ready with me. Somebody has uh, the problems, and I know a lot of people do, snoring or uh, problems with breathing in the night. I would wake up in the morning before I got this machine with my throat so dry, and I knew that's because I was not breathing on my nose, you know, rather by with, because snoring, you know, I opened my mouth and, and I, my throat was so dry. Not now. Personally, I could rest better because I, I, I don't get panic, panicky because I hear how he breathes. So uh, anytime I wake up or he's um, breathing normally. And that's before you, because you um, witnessed it before, now it's look like a mir it looks like a miracle. <laughs> You know, when you don't breathe mm. properly for a while and then you see somebody normal, it's like, wow, I have a peace of, I have peace of mind after this happened and um, he looks happier, his disposition is better. That's what I feel. You could see a person that didn't rest for a few nights, it's all miserable. So something like that. So as soon as he started using it, um, his driving was better and everything, everything. Uh, as I said, I give all the credits to my wife. I'm so happy that she was so determined to push me to do this, you know. Um, you should try. Anybody who has problems like this, they definitely try it. Definitely test it. Life-changing for someone with sleep apnea. There are other causes and cures for insomnia, including an emergent treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Here, Dr. Param explains. It's important to break it down. Cognitive, our thoughts, behaviors, our reactions to those thoughts and to the world around us, that as therapy. What we do know, cognitive behavioral therapy has many parts. One of them is understanding something called stimulus control, something else appreciating that of sleep restriction, and also getting into appreciating the cognitive restructuring and relaxation. So what are those? Those are fancy terms. Yes. <laughs> the stimulus control, the first part of it what thoughts and what are our environment triggers that are getting our awareness, that's getting the, what we call hyperarousal. That's the thing that we want to start identifying, mostly the thoughts and the stressors in our lives. And understanding when close to bedtime, it can jazz any human being to have a harder time getting to sleep. The awareness piece is so important. Getting into another key component, sleep restriction. Giving an appreciation, we call it something about sleep efficiency. When somebody's looking at their bedtime, roughly 85% of it should be sleep time. If not, then you are associating bed time with wake up time, which is not fun and very hurtful. So what we want to appreciate, say somebody's getting nine hours of bedtime, but already sleeping for a five and a half. And after they do sleep logs or diaries for say two weeks, we'll do something pretty drastic. We're say, you're gonna go to bed at midnight, it looks like, set your clock for 5.30 in the morning. Somebody goes, well, that's really early. That's not that much sleep. Well, that's all the sleep you're getting right now. So we want them to now start associating bedtime and sleep time in a much more consolidated way. And then they'll build on 15 minutes every few days as they maintain this ability to have bedtime and sleep time roughly overlap. Can somebody be very tired? Yes. Should they be careful driving and doing some important delicate tasks? It is very difficult. The cognitive restructuring part and the relaxation is the one to start appreciating that our thoughts do matter. When we start believing our thoughts, they can be overwhelming and they can be destructive in that of our lives. The ability to disconnect with those thoughts and to really get more into the body. It was said to me many years ago, if you spend too much time in your head, you gotta get back into your body. Being a former academic, 
I spend way too much time in my head. So I can really relate to appreciating what are these different type of techniques to relax. Cognitive behavioral therapy may sound simplistic, but it does take some time because when you're exhausted and tired, obvious things are not always so obvious. Mm. And, and finally, let's talk about, some, about sleep apnea, S obstructive and central. You, you mentioned those before. Majority of them are obstructive. And what we know is that's the poor airflow through the nose, the back of the, uh, the tongue, down lower in the throat. Airflow needs to be there. When you have better airway, you can breathe, and that allows to circulate oxygen. So how is it treated? So the famous conversation that nobody really wants to hear about is positive airway pressure, famously the continuous positive airway pressure called CPAP. There's different versions of CPAP that allow it to be much more comfortable and easier for a person. It's a fancy blower. It's like an air splint, so the airway is not collapsing on itself, so it can breathe much easier. When somebody has severe sleep apnea, meaning 30 times an hour or more, there's nothing better. There are some other things to look at, the different categories of it, the mild, the moderate, a dental device that moves the lower jaw forward. So I always tell people to think about it, go out and make a snore sound, and then, right, I'll just mimic it, I'll be awkward so no one else has to worry about them making the sound. Now, move in the lower jaw so the top and bottom teeth are more on top of one another. It's harder to snore for some of us when our lower jaw is forward. So dental appliances can be very helpful if somebody's a back sleeper and their jaw is falling back and collapsing their airway, or some of those people that just need more room and need to move that forward. For other people, it's opening up the nasal passages. For other people, it's time to put the nightcap down. Better yet, nobody really should take a nightcap, meaning alcohol before bed. It's a muscle relaxant, but also relaxes the muscles. And for the first hour right after having a nightcap, you'll be more relaxed and also have the airway more relaxed. In the second hour, the brain's more fidgety as it's clearing out the toxins of alcohol. So that's really important to help people learn that if they're gonna have beer, wine, spirits, not have it just before bedtime. Weight loss, very fickle. When we gain weight, it doesn't just go outward, it can go inward, and it can make it much more difficult to have a deep breath and to have effective breathing. When somebody gains weight, it's harder to breathe and they don't sleep as well. But if they sleep better, they tend to lose weight. So it's really fickle. And you gotta jump in and help with people as they start this conversation, as they start experimenting with it. It's usually the first ways to enter this whole discussion. The central sleep apnea tends to be the ones where the brain forgets to trigger that of a breath. And there's some very sophisticated machines that help the time in your breath and have a backup rate. So they initiate a breath if the brain forgets. Less common, but it's still there. And that's the reason why a sleep study can help differentiate these. Often people will just fall back on sleeping pills. Uh, if somebody came into me with excruciating pain, I would talk to them about how to control their pain. And would that of pharmaceutical and pills be reasonable? Yes. It shouldn't be the first, second, and third answer, and then no other. In other words, it may be the right thing at the right time but then speak about how long someone should be on that. Whenever looking at insomnia, that's where really this is discussing, we have to look at signs and symptoms, but people then usually run to treatment. You gotta look at what's going on, why is it happening? Start really getting down to the causes. So sometimes when somebody's so exhausted and, and despondent, I think it's compassionate and helpful. Rarely do I believe anybody needs these lifelong. Somebody has brain trauma, somebody has out of the a brain surgery, they may need it long term. But I always like to suggest it as such. Let the pills be a bridge, but not an island. I don't want somebody on a pill lifelong, but to help that person to make a transition. Some people will say they don't have time to do the others, but the side effects do accumulate. There's a famous appreciation of something in science called Beer's Criteria. It means at a certain age, our pharmaceuticals can have much more side effects, especially that work in the brain's chemistry. So with the biggest conversations of any sedative, hypnotics as we call them, is grogginess. When you wake up in the middle of the night, you're more likely to slip and fall. You're more likely to do some things that are not very helpful to yourself. And that can really be destructive and potentially even deadly. So the right thing for the right person at the right time. So if you know you have a problem with sleep, be sure to seek help. 
Don't delay like George did, losing quality of life day after day, altering body, mind and spirit. If your problem is sleep apnea, see a sleep specialist. If it's insomnia, get a self-help book or see a psychologist for cognitive behavioural therapy. If you have shift work, consider melatonin. And if it's restless leg syndrome, be sure you have no deficiencies. And if you don't have a sleep disorder, be sure to honour bedtime so you get seven to nine hours of sleep every night. Then you can give tomorrow all the zest and vigour it demands. That's all for me today. Thanks for joining us on Go Healthy For Good. I'll see you next time.